Hello and welcome to another lesson on Make Science Easy. Today we are looking at the topic of movement in and out of cells. This is a really, really important lesson. This lesson builds on concepts covered in previous lessons. If you've not watched or didn't fully understand the lessons on cells or life processes, then it's recommended that you cover these lessons before advancing onto this one. Other lessons so far have been based purely on knowledge. Today we are looking at concepts. Much of what we can learn in today's lesson can be applied to other lessons. It's also going to cross over with other areas of science, including chemistry. So, we need to know about movement in and out of our cells. And all cells, as we already know, contribute towards the seven life processes. In order for that to happen, substances such as glucose and oxygen need to pass into cells. Waste products are produced. They need to be removed from our cells. And remember, substances enter and exit a cell through the cell membrane, through our partially permeable membrane. Some things are allowed in, other things are allowed out. Not everything. We need to look today at the process of how things go in and out of our cells. There are two methods that substances can use to enter and exit a cell. The first one, and the one we're going to be mainly looking at today, is diffusion. This is a passive process that happens naturally with no intervention and it requires no additional energy being added to it. The second process which we're not really going to look at today but will be mentioned in an advanced lesson is that of active transport. This is a process that requires energy from the cell. The cell has to spend its energy currency on making this work. There's also a third way that particles can move in and out, and this is relating to water and water only. And diffusion of water and nothing else is called osmosis. Again, this is something we're going to look at in another lesson. It's a bit more advanced, but today we are mainly focusing on diffusion. How does diffusion work? Well, we have our cell membrane. As we already know, there are tiny, tiny holes in that cell membrane. Things that are small enough can pass through. In diffusion, substances always move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. They never ever move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So we can see we've got an area of low concentration. On the left side of the membrane, there aren't many particles there. Low concentration. On the right side of the membrane, there are lots and lots of particles. High concentration. If you've covered some of the chemistry already, you'll know that this model isn't particularly accurate. Liquids should be touching. We're just trying to model this to make sure we understand it. So it's not a perfect model of a liquid, but it will do. What you'll also know from the chemistry if you've done it, is that the particles are always moving. And the movement of particles is random. So let's see what happens when the particles start to move. The particles move randomly. Overall, particles move from where there is a high concentration to where there is a low concentration. Eventually, you will end up with the same amount of particles on both sides of the membrane. So net diffusion moves particles from a high concentration to a low concentration. What you'll also notice is that when there is no concentration gradient, the particles are still moving. They don't stop moving at all. They move from a high concentration to a low concentration. When the gradient is even, the particles still move, and some particles move to the left, some particles move to the right, but the overall concentration gradient stays the same. There is no change in gradient. Average movement of particles is from a high to a low concentration. Even when the concentrations are equal, particles keep on moving, but there is no net diffusion. One side doesn't get a high concentration, the other side doesn't get a low concentration, it stays the same. Even when you have a concentration gradient with one side with high concentration and one side with low concentration, some particles will still move from a low to a high concentration, but more particles are going to move the other way. More particles are going to move from a high to a low concentration. And when there's no concentration gradient at all, the concentrations remain equal. Diffusion always balances the concentrations. Diffusion always makes sure that you have equal concentrations on both sides of the membrane. So if we look at an example of how this is going to work, we've got a cell here and we've got three chemicals, all of which are involved in respiration. I haven't included water just for simplicity because then we start getting a bit too much in here. 
we've got glucose, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. We can see that outside of this cell, we have more glucose molecules than we do inside of the cell. So we've got a low concentration of glucose in the cell, a high concentration outside the cell. We've got more carbon dioxide in the cell and less carbon dioxide out of the cell. High concentration in the cell, low concentration outside of the cell. We've got more oxygen outside the cell and less in the cell. High concentration of oxygen outside the cell, low concentration of oxygen inside the cell. What's going to happen after diffusion takes place? We should have an equal concentration of both. So let's see. We can see the glucose moves in to the cell and we have an equal amount of glucose inside and outside of the cell. Oxygen moves into the cell by diffusion. We have an equal amount of oxygen inside the cell and outside of the cell. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cell. We have an equal amount of carbon dioxide inside the cell and an equal amount of carbon dioxide outside of the cell. After diffusion, there is no concentration gradient. The concentration remains the same. Now, diffusion is affected by a number of factors. The first thing, and the most obvious thing that's going to affect it, is the concentration gradient. The bigger the difference between the two concentrations, the faster diffusion occurs. If you have one very, very high concentration and one very low concentration, diffusion will happen quickly. If the two concentrations are fairly even, diffusion will happen much slower. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion. If you've done the chemistry modules already, you will know as temperature increases, the kinetic energy of particles increases. They move faster. If particles move faster, they diffuse faster. Also, particle size is important. Bigger particles diffuse slower than smaller particles. This is because bigger particles collide more, so they are stopped by those collisions. The final thing that makes a difference is diffusion distance. If a particle has to diffuse a long way, it's going to take a long time to do it. If it has to diffuse a short distance, it's going to take a short amount of time to do it. This is why the cell membrane is so thin, to allow diffusion to take place quickly. It reduces the diffusion distance. Now diffusion has a real big impact on the size of cells. The reason why we don't see unicellular organisms being massive is because of diffusion. Diffusion will take too long if the cell is too big. We can understand why cells can't be too big by looking at the surface area to volume ratio of a cell. To keep things simple, we're going to represent cells with cubes. The first thing we need to do is we need to work out the surface area of a cube. If you're struggling with the maths, there are resources with this lesson that will help you, that will break this down even further than I am now. To calculate the surface area, we need to use a very simple equation. We need to multiply the length and the width of any one face. To keep things simple here, the length and the width of this cube are one centimetre. So, I do one times one. One centimetre times one centimetre is one centimetre squared. Including units is vital here. Because it's a cube, I have six faces. If one face is one centimetre squared, then I need to multiply that by six, my number of faces. 1 cm squared times 6 is 6 cm squared. The next thing that I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to work out the volume. In order to calculate volume, we use a different equation. Volume is equal to length times width times height. So I've added the height in. Again, it's a cube. It's going to be 1 cm. So, to work out the volume, my length, 1 cm, times my width, 1 cm, times my height, 1 cm. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, and I must include my unit, centimetres cubed. My final calculation for this cube is going to be the surface area to volume ratio. The ratio is the surface area divided by the volume. So in this case, 6 centimetres squared divided by 1 centimetre, my ratio is 6 to 1. I don't need to include any units, it is a ratio. 6 to 1 means there is 6 times more surface area than volume. This makes diffusion easy. Diffusion distance is small. So what happens if I make this cell bigger? Well, I'm going to double the length of everything now. And we're going to see what happens. But if the cells are too big, diffusion will take too long. If diffusion takes too long, the cell will die. How do you expect to change the ratio? Well, let's see. My surface area is 2 times 2. 
2 times 2 is obviously 4. I've got 6 sides, so it's 24 centimetres squared. That is much bigger than the last one. My volume is 2 times 2 times 2, which gives me 8 centimetres cubed. Again, much more than before. So by doubling the length of the sides, I've times the volume by 8. Pretty strange, but it's a mathematical relationship, not something we're going to be looking at. The final thing I need to do is work out the ratio of surface area to volume. Again, it's my surface area, 24 centimetres squared, divided by 8 centimetres cubed, my volume. It gives me a ratio of 3 to 1. Unsurprisingly, if I double all the lengths, my ratio halves. So what's happening? It's now much harder for things to diffuse in my cell. The surface area to volume ratio is smaller. In order for a cell to be successful, it needs to have a large surface area to volume ratio. Small surface area to volume ratios slow down diffusion. In summary, substances move in and out of cells by diffusion or active transport. Diffusion always moves substances from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. When there's no overall concentration gradient, net diffusion stops, but particles continue to move. Simply, the concentrations of both sides stays the same, but particles move from one side to the other. Cells are limited to their size due to the speed of diffusion. You cannot have a large cell because the surface area to volume ratio is too small. If the surface area to volume ratio gets too small, diffusion takes too long and the cell will die. Don't forget to use the resources to help your learning. Make sure you really understand the maths as well. Make sure you understand the concept. If there's anything that you didn't understand or any questions you want to ask about this video, then make sure you write in the comments. I'll try and answer them as soon as I can. Thank you for watching this video on movement in and out of cells. I hope that you've learned something. If you have learned lots in these videos, then please visit our website www.makescienceeasy.com and sign up for more information. There are loads more lessons for you, loads of free resources available, and I thoroughly recommend it. It is going to help your success in science. If you've enjoyed this video, then please like it and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Until next time, keep learning.